question and answer 58. What comfort takest thou from the article of life everlasting? That since I now feel in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, after this life I shall inherit perfect salvation, which I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man to conceive, and that to praise God therein forever. Beloved, the last article of the Apostles' Creed, which the Heidelberg Catechism has been expounding, is, I believe, the life everlasting. We saw last week one of the great benefits that we have after death. We have the everlasting life of the soul during what we call the intermediate state. And then on the last day, we have life of the body, when the body of the believer is raised from the dead by the power of Jesus Christ. Now this question and answer deal with not the intermediate state, but with the eternal state. That is, the state of the child of God after the second coming of Christ, after the bodily resurrection, and after the day of judgment. What we commonly call heaven. Heaven. Heaven, of course, is the eternal home of the triune God, of all of the angels, of our mediator and saviour, Jesus Christ, and of all the saints, all those who believe in Jesus Christ, and they die and they go to heaven. But we do not know much about heaven, because those who die and go to heaven, ordinarily, do not return to tell us anything about heaven, and therefore all of those books in the bookstore about life in heaven are all nonsense. You can burn them, don't bother buying them. You'll learn nothing about heaven from such books. And those who have come from heaven, angels and Christ himself, have only told us a limited amount about heaven. And much of what the Bible tells us about heaven is given to us in the form of symbols and visions, especially as we read in the book of Revelation. And much of that is given to us in negative language. We learn what is not there. No crying, no weeping, no pain, no death, and so on. But a positive picture of heaven is more difficult for us to have. And so we know some things about heaven. The Bible teaches us some things about heaven. But there's so much more that we would like to know. And God doesn't give us all the information about heaven because he wants us to long for heaven so that we <coughs> prepare ourselves to dwell there. But 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, which is quoted in the Heidelberg Catechism, is an often misunderstood text. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That might give you the impression that we could not possibly know anything about heaven, because I have not seen it. No man has even imagined what heaven is like. But that's not how the chapter continues. The next verse says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. And so the Bible reveals to us some things about heaven, enough for us to know in this life, Enough for us to have a taste of it, as it were, so we can anticipate it and look forward to it. And we receive that by the Holy Spirit working by means of the Word. Let's look then at the life everlasting. The life everlasting. First, we look at inconceivable blessedness. Then, the inheritance of perfect salvation. And finally, the beginning of eternal 
joy. There are many notions about heaven in the world which are popular, but we should forget all of them. Heaven is not floating on clouds and plucking harps, as if we have wings like the angels. The first thing we notice about heaven, which is revealed to us in Revelation 21 and elsewhere, is that heaven, as we call it, will be one unified universe called the new heaven and the new earth. Verse 1 of Revelation 21, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. We learn in 2 Peter chapter 3 especially that when Jesus returns, he will destroy this present earth. It will pass away. It will be, as Peter explains it, purged with fire, cleansed of every trace of sin and made new. Now this does not mean that the earth on which we live and the heaven which exists now will be annihilated and then recreated all over again ex nihilo out of nothing. God never simply begins all over again. What God will do, he will apply the purifying element of fire to this present universe. He will melt it down to its elements, Peter says, and will reform the universe so that it has none of the imperfections and impurities and problems of sin that we see today. And every trace of the devil's malice will be gone forever. Second Peter 3 describes it as a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so this universe in which we live is going to be restored to its original former glory. In fact, it will be more glorious than Eden was at the beginning. And so imagine, therefore, when you think about heaven, not some faraway cloud place, but think of a new heaven and a new earth. Think of something that we can understand as a physical place, not simply a high up heaven and a low down earth, but rather that heaven and earth will come together as one entity. That's the idea. And that God therefore will raise this earth out of its shame and sin and elevate it to heaven. And at the same time, heaven will come down from earth in the new Jerusalem. Now this is the opposite of what the Jehovah's Witness cult teaches. You may have met them. They have an idea of there's a heavenly kingdom, 144,000 are going to be in that spiritual heavenly kingdom, and there will be a paradise earth. The rest of the faithful Jehovah's Witnesses will live upon paradise earth. It's in their magazine. You can see the wonderful pictures of it. And the rest of the people will be annihilated, destroyed, gone, because they won't be part of either of those two kingdoms. That's not what it is like in the Bible. You don't have two separate peoples, a heavenly people and an earthly people. You have one people of God who inhabit the new heavens and the new earth. And it says in verse 1 that there shall be no more sea. Now I don't take that literally to mean that there will be no sea, no ocean, and only a river, but I take that to mean that the sea that we have today, the vast oceans that we have today, will be ultimately transformed so that they are not the kind of sea we have today. The sea we have today is a dangerous place. It is a place of turmoil, a place of chaos, and it is a barrier between the nations of the world. For your loved ones to come from America, they have to fly across this vast ocean to get here. The idea being, there will be no more sea in that sense. And there will be perfect communication between heaven and earth. It will be one unified universe. 
And the inhabitants of this new heaven and new earth will be the triune God, Jesus Christ, the angels, and the glorified saints of all ages. And Revelation 21 makes it clear by means of a vision that the church of Jesus Christ will be at the centerpiece of this new creation. Notice, as soon as John sees the new heaven and the new earth which God has just created, he sees the new and holy Jerusalem descending, coming down out of heaven from God. And this is not an earthly city, the city of Jerusalem in the Middle East today. This is not even the nation of the Jews. This is the church because verse 9 tells us that the new Jerusalem is the Lamb's wife and we know of course from the whole of the New Testament and the book of Revelation in particular that the Lamb's wife is the church. The new Jerusalem then will be the church as she has always existed in the mind of God, the church which God has planned as the glorious body and bride of Christ, the perfected, glorified church, which has no more spot or wrinkle or blemish, as Ephesians 5 promises. And so we see a picture of the church in Revelation 21 in her glorification as a tremendously beautiful and blessed and glorious city, perfect in dimensions, a perfect cube, as we will see later, filled with the glory of God, shining and radiant in her beauty, and adorned with all kinds of beautiful things, gold, pearls, precious stones of all kinds, all of it pointing to the beauty of the glorified church of Jesus Christ, and the beauty of the church is the glory of Jesus Christ himself. And this new Jerusalem is the one holy and Catholic Church made up of all believers from the beginning of the world to the end of the world as they have been gathered through history from all nations, Jews and Gentiles alike. Revelation 21 knows nothing about a division between Jews and Gentiles in the church. And of course it doesn't, because the whole New Testament is opposed to the idea of there being two peoples of God, Jews and Gentiles. She's called the Lamb's wife in verse 9. And within her, you will notice, you have the twelve apostles of the Lamb, verse 14, and within the same city, you have the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Which tells us, in symbolic language, that this church, this new Jerusalem, this holy city, will consist of Adam and Eve, Abel, Noah, all the Old Testament saints, the disciples of Jesus, the apostles, all those who converted during Jesus' earthly ministry, all those converted during the last 2,000 years of New Testament church history, all the way to the end with Antichrist and the last Christian martyr, all of them together in one church, which is the blessed city called the New Jerusalem. So you have to imagine, therefore, a new heavens and a new earth, <coughs> different from what we have today, but more glorious, perfected, purged from all sin, and at the very center of that new heavens and the new earth is the church of Jesus Christ, pictured in Revelation 21 as a glorious city. And life in the new heavens and the new earth, in the new and holy heavenly Jerusalem, will be inconceivably blessed. That's why the Catechism describes it. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man to conceive of these things 
and it's only because it has been revealed. No person could have invented such a vision or such an amazing future for the church of Jesus Christ. It pales, really. It pales before this notion that we have of, of, of heaven. Fluffy clouds and parks and so on. Nothing to do with that. Much more glorious than that. And there are several reasons in chapter 21 for this blessedness or several aspects to this blessedness. And the first and most important aspect to this blessedness will be it consists of fellowship with the triune God in Jesus Christ. That's verse 3. Here is the essence of the blessedness of heaven in verse 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And verse 7 says, I will be his God, and he shall be <coughs> my son. This, therefore, is the fulfillment and conclusion of God's great purpose, which was, from the very beginning, that he would dwell with his people in love and in covenant friendship and fellowship and communion. That he would reveal himself to his people as the blessed triune God of the covenant and cause them to taste and know that he is good. That's why God created man and woman at the beginning. That's the life that God gave to Adam and Eve before the fall. They walked with him in the garden. They had fellowship with him. That's the life that Enoch had and Noah had. They walked with God too. That's the tabernacle in the wilderness. The idea of God dwelling in the midst of his people in the Holy of Holies, which then became more permanent in the tabernacle, again, in the Holy of Holies. And heaven, the new heavens and new earth, will be the consummation and perfection of that covenant. Then it will be said that God's tabernacle is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And that is the highest blessedness that man could ever know. To know God to be his own God, to taste the life of God, to experience the favour of God, to bask in the grace of God, to see the glory of God, to have God be with us and call us his children. That is blessedness beyond anything that we could possibly conceive. And this blessedness, this fellowship, will be with the infinite and eternal and invisible triune God through Jesus Christ. And therefore, it ought not to surprise us that the focus of heaven will be Jesus <coughs> Christ himself. And that's clear also in Revelation 21. The church is only the church because of her relationship to Christ. She is the bride, the Lamb's wife. The Lamb is the temple of the city, the center of the fellowship of that city, the center of the worship of that city. Verse 22 tells us, the Lamb is the light of the city. In the glory and the light of the Lamb, the inhabitants of that city shall walk. And chapter 22, verse 3 tells us that the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And that's the blessedness of heaven. The Lamb, who is Christ, and the Lamb's wife, which is the church, who have been betrothed to one another, engaged, as it were, for such a long time, and the Lamb 
and the Lamb's wife have been waiting for this moment throughout the whole of New Testament history, really, when their marriage will finally be consummated, and then they will finally be together and never separated again, forever together, and they will enjoy the marriage feast of the Lamb, which is described in chapter 19. And this will not be a marriage feast which lasts a day, or seven days, or a month, but will be an everlasting marriage feast, a wedding with Jesus Christ, which goes on forever and ever and ever. And so any notion of heaven that the world might have, which does not have Jesus Christ in it, and does not have Jesus Christ at the very center of it, is by definition a false view of heaven. And if heaven does not have Jesus Christ in it, and if heaven does not have Christ at the very center of it, then we as the children of God can say in all seriousness, we are not interested in going to heaven. Heaven would have no attraction to us if Jesus Christ were not there. So fellowship is really the heart of the blessedness of heaven. And the passage we read together, chapter 21, describes to us in great detail the glory and perfection and beauty of the place of heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. It will shine with the radiant glory, all the perfections of God himself and of the Lamb. And here scripture is using symbolic language, borrowing from the language of men, trying to put into words, as it were, how glorious heaven is by describing things which to man are most glorious. Those things which are to man most precious, those things which are to man most beautiful. And so we are immediately impressed when we read the description of the new Jerusalem. Everything precious is included there. Everything valuable and costly. God is describing here for us something which he has prepared carefully and something for which he has spared no expense, you might say. For what is more valuable to man, especially man as he lived at the time of John in the first century AD, what was more valuable and precious and costly than gold? And then pearls, which are so large you can make a gate out of them. And precious stones, not one kind of precious stone, but 12 kinds of precious stones. And not just ordinary gold, but the purest gold, which was so pure it appeared like transparent glass. Enormous jewels, enormous pearls, pearls of great price, gold. And then, if that appears too artificial to you, gold, pearls, you have the beautiful garden in chapter 22. You have a river of water of life. You have fruit trees. You have fruit. You have the throne of God, you have the throne of the Lamb, you have the service of the Lamb. All of it is to give us an idea of how beautiful and glorious it is. And as we have said, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man to conceive of how glorious these things are. John received them in a vision. John could never have conceived them of his own mind. Human reason would never have come to such a conclusion as this. And then the city of Revelation 21 is described as the New Jerusalem as a perfect or an ideal city. A city has the idea of a community, an ordered society. A permanent dwelling place. Not a tent, but a city. A kingdom with a king, with rules, with citizens, with blessings. A city with walls, 
but a city without gates, or at least gates which never close, and a city which has no night, indicates that this will be a city of permanence, a city of perfect security, of safety, and of peace. There will be no fear in this city that one day some horrible enemy is going to come and destroy the peace of the city because all of the enemies of God at this point have been cast into the lake of fire. And the devil will never be able to harm this city. The city is also perfect in terms of its dimensions. If you read the dimensions of the city, 12,000 furlongs, which is 1,500 miles or 2,200 kilometers. Imagine a perfect cube, 2,200 kilometers high, wide, and long. That's the language used in this chapter. And with it, we have a wall of 144 cubits, which is 200 feet or 65 meters. So that could mean thick, the wall is that thick, or high, the wall is that high. We're not sure exactly what that means. But do we take these things literally? The question is, do we think that heaven is literally going to be a city, a perfect cube, with these measurements? No, we don't. Revelation is a book of symbols. The numbers also are symbolic. But it ought not to escape us that this is a perfect cube. What else in the Bible was a perfect cube? The Holy of Holies in the temple was a perfect cube. So the idea of a perfect cube is that the measurements indicate perfect ideal fellowship with God, measuring like the Holy of Holies. 12,000, remember, is three, the number of God, the Trinity, Four, the number of creation, times ten, times ten, the number of perfection, twice. Perfect fellowship between God and men, twelve thousand. Now this new heaven and new earth and the life in that blessed place after death and after the coming of Jesus Christ are called our inheritance. The Heidelberg Catechism, following scripture, says, After this life I shall inherit perfect salvation. And verse 7 of chapter 21 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But that language ought to be familiar to someone who reads the Bible. The Bible often speaks about our salvation in terms of our inheritance. The word inherit, the word inheritance, the word heritage, the word lot, the word portion are repeatedly used in the Old Testament. And that language continues into the new. Heirs and co-heirs. Israel had the land of Canaan as their inheritance. And each person each Israelite had his allotted portion of land, which was called his particular inheritance, and that could not be sold to anyone else in the nation of Israel. Had he passed from father to son. In the Old Testament, God promised that the meek would inherit the earth. Jesus repeats that promise in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verse 5. And the rest of the New Testament the same language. Jesus says to those who are the sheep on the day of judgment, inherit the kingdom. The epistles speak of this too. Ephesians 1 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Ephesians 1 18, the glory of his inheritance in his saints. Colossians 1 12, partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light one more, 1 Peter 1 4, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. And that word inheritance is significant because we know what an inheritance is. An inheritance is not something that you work for, 
that you earn, that you merit by means of hard work. An inheritance is always a gracious gift given by a father to his children. Now, how can we inherit anything from God? We who are by nature sinners. Well, the idea given to us in the Bible is that we are, first of all, adopted. Adopted, and therefore we become heirs. We become heirs of God, the Bible tells us, and co-heirs with Christ by adoption. The Bible tells us, too, that you cannot have an inheritance unless the testator, that is the one who writes the testament or the will, dies. The book of Hebrews tells us that the testator is Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, and therefore he has written the will, you might say, the testament. He dies. He died on the cross to make us heirs of this inheritance, so that this inheritance will be paid out to us in full, to give us a legal claim to the inheritance. So when we read the Bible, we can say to ourselves, I am reading in the Bible, I am reading the last will and testament, you might say, of my Heavenly Father. He has promised to give me all of the blessings which are contained in this last will and testament. I'm going to receive it as an inheritance after this life, and I have already begun to receive that inheritance because Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity, <coughs> has died on the cross that I might have that inheritance. Because God loves me, he has provided this inheritance for me, and he gives it to me. This inheritance, we understand, comes to us in installments. In this life, we receive a down payment, or a deposit, or an earnest of this inheritance. And afterwards, we shall receive, or inherit, the perfect salvation. The deposit, or the down payment, or the earnest that we receive, is the Holy Spirit himself. And he is not only the deposit, as Paul explains it in Ephesians 1, but he is the guarantee that the rest of it will come to us on the last day. And so in this life, the Holy Spirit makes us members of Jesus Christ by faith. In this life, the Holy Spirit assures us that we are the children of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And in this life, he applies to us the forgiveness of sins. But as you know from your own personal experience as a Christian, we still struggle with sin throughout this life. We live in a world affected by sin under God's curse. And we long for the final inheritance, the complete inheritance promised to us. We receive some more of that inheritance when we die. Immediate glory in the presence of Jesus Christ in our soul, as we saw last time. But our final inheritance, the final part of our salvation, comes to us only at the end of time, when Jesus Christ returns and gives us all of it, as we are glorified not only in soul, but in body, and as we enter into the everlasting kingdom of God in the new heavens and the new earth. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about Christ as the first fruits of them that slept. And sleeping there refers to physical death. So Christ was the first fruits of those who died. He was raised up to be the first fruits. Remember what the first fruits are in the Old Testament law. Before the harvest was complete, the farmer would take the first sheaf of corn, let's say, and would dedicate that to God in the temple. That was the first fruits of his harvest. That was the first part of his harvest, and it was a guarantee for the rest of the harvest. And then the farmer didn't just 
take another sheaf the next day, and the sheaf the week after that, and the sheaf. He waited until the final harvest, and then he gathered the whole field, and that was his harvest. That's the idea of the first fruits. Jesus was the first fruits 2,000 years ago. All the bodies of all the saints will be raised at the last day as the final harvest at one time on the last day. It's not that Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago and he gathered some of his people out of the graves a hundred years after that and then a few years down the road. No, it's one more harvest at the end of time. We must therefore wait until everything is ready and then all at once at the end of time all of God's people will be raised from the dead and all of them at the same time will receive the inheritance, the final inheritance when everything is ready, when all the heirs have been gathered. And this final inheritance and this final salvation are described in Revelation 21 in terms of the removal of sin and the removal of all of the effects of sin. That's verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Death. That's the main idea there. Death is banished from the new heavens and the new earth, because death is the wages of sin. And since Christ has died, Death has no more power over the child of God for whom Christ <coughs> died. And death is the cause of all of the other sorrow in that verse. Pain, heartache, crying, tears. All of these things come from death and caused by death and therefore none of them will be known in the new creation. There will be no reason to weep in heaven. All the weeping of this life will be over and forgotten. And so the Bible says that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Not the idea that the confusion cry in heaven, but that God will wipe away all the tears that they cried before they came to heaven. Instead of crying and weeping, there will be perfect rejoicing and life. And why do we have all this? But well, we ought to cry. We ought to have a life filled with weeping and sorrow and death because of sin. We deserve to weep endless tears and experience unending sorrow in the lake of fire because of sin, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God gives us an inheritance where there is no weeping, there is no crying, there is no death, a creation free from all the effects of sin because Christ himself wept tears, sweated blood, and died on the cross for us. He went through all of the awful suffering and died on the cross so that we could experience the new heavens and the new earth and the blessedness of God wiping away the tears from our eyes so we could drink freely we're told, of the water of life and have access, as we see in chapter 22, to the tree of life. And we'll always remember that in heaven. We'll always know the reason I am here in this glorious place, a place I could never even have imagined when I was upon the earth, a place which my minister tried to describe to me, but I couldn't even get close it's so glorious. The reason I am here is because of what Christ has done. I do not deserve to be here. And that's why we will worship the Lamb. That's why we love the Lamb. Because he loved us first and died on the cross for us. To give us this great inheritance of heaven. And that's another reason why heaven is so blessed. 
is a place without sin. A place without even the possibility of sin. A place where we will be active in serving God and the Lamb without the hindrance of sin, without the hindrance of the devil or the sinful world. We ought not think, as often these books of myth would cause us to think, that heaven will be a place of inactivity of sitting on clouds and strumming a harp and doing nothing for all eternity. That's not what heaven's going to be like. It will be a place of activity. We're told in chapter 22, verse 3, his servants shall serve him. It will be, you might even say, a place of bustling activity, active worship, active praising, active serving God forever, not flitting about from cloud to cloud and strumming a harp. But perhaps to many Christians that sounds rather unappealing. That sounds rather boring. An endless church service, let's say, endlessly in a choir, forever and ever and ever, without any break. That's hardly appealing to a child. A child is saying, when we go to a place like that, a church forever and ever and ever, singing forever. How boring would that be? But that's not what we ought to think. We ought to think more of the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve, they served God in the Garden of Eden, and it was their daily delight to serve God in the Garden of Eden. And we will be able to do this, mind you, and this is almost impossible for us to imagine, without the weariness of the flesh. We'll never get tired of doing it. We have difficulty praying for more than a few minutes without our minds starting to wander or becoming tired. We get out of breath after singing for more than a few minutes as well. Our bodies are weak. And we have, of course, the sinful nature, which is always hindering us and always trying to distract us away from doing the things that we ought to do. But we will have in heaven a new body, which is completely under the power of the Holy Spirit. We will have no sinful flesh. We will have no weariness and well-doing as we have today. We will have no sinful lusts, which will take us away from God. There'll be no evil distractions. There'll be no boredom. It will be endless refreshment and eternal joy. And that's the idea, really, of verse 6 about this fountain of water. We will be endlessly refreshed with a fountain of living water. There will be a, a river clear as crystal coming out of the throne of God and the Lamb, chapter 22, verse 1 says. There will be all these fruits which will refresh us day and daily. We will never be hungry or tired or thirsty. We will have endless energy and endless zeal to serve God. And I say it's difficult for us to imagine. But as we live here below, it is our chief complaint that we cannot serve God as we would desire. We long to have that fellowship with God that we know is promised to us in the Word of God. We have those moments where we have sweet fellowship with our Saviour in prayer, or in reading His Word, or in church. But those moments are brief and fleeting. We're always hindered by our sins. Our flesh is always stirring up our passions and our sinful desires. And there, in heaven, in the new heavens and earth, we will be free forever and finally from that old sinful nature. No devil to tempt us. Only perfect righteousness and holiness. Then, we will finally be able to serve God as we have always wanted to serve God with our whole heart, our soul, and mind, and strength. And we will love our neighbours, who are our fellow saints, as ourselves. There'll be no envy there. There'll be no 
lust after what our neighbor has, no pride, no sin to spoil the fellowship that we have with our neighbor as we have <coughs> here below. That's the picture that the Bible gives us of our life in the eternal state. And the Heidelberg Catechism asks us what comfort take us by from this. And really the question can be asked this way, how do you know that you will be in heaven? How do you know that this will be your joy, your future, as we have described it this evening? The answer is, according to the Catechism, that we begin to taste heaven already in this life, since I now feel in my heart the beginning of eternal joy. But that's not a feeling, some kind of inexplicable emotional feeling that you have, but rather it is speaking about the assurance by faith. Assurance is always by faith. And so the question comes to us, and the question is very easy for us to answer. Do you believe in Jesus Christ today? Is he the one that your heart loves? Is his cross your only confidence and your only joy? Can you imagine yourself feeling at home in a place where the Lamb is the light? Where you because you belong to him. Feel at home and know yourself to belong. Do you think that your sins are too great to exclude you from that place? <coughs> Do you seek forgiveness of sins today? Do you sorrow over your sins today? Do you come daily to the cross of Christ and do you experience the forgiveness of sins when you come to him? Do you now seek, albeit imperfectly, to live a new and holy life in gratitude for what Jesus Christ has done for you. Then you can know and you must know that this new heavens and new earth which we have looked at this evening, this new Jerusalem, this glorious city, is being prepared for you by your Heavenly Father and that God will certainly finish that good work which he has begun in you. Philippians 1. Verse 6. Because heaven, you see, is simply the place where the believer who already knows Jesus Christ will know him perfectly, even as he himself is known. And that's why, too, the unbeliever has no place in heaven. What we have described this evening. You will not hear in one of these books in a secular bookstore on heaven. An unbeliever is not interested in the heaven which I have sought to describe in the Word of God this evening. How can an unbeliever be happy in a place where there is no sin, when he loves sin? How can he be happy in a place where all of the inhabitants are holy believers in Jesus Christ, when he despises the Church of Christ? on the earth. How could he want to be in a place where all the, the focus of activity is upon God? He'd find that very boring. He has no interest in that. And how does he expect, the unbeliever, how does he expect to have eternal fellowship with God and Jesus Christ when he does not have that eternal fellowship with God and Jesus Christ now? He does not pray. He does not worship God. He does not read the Bible. He does not serve God below. Why would he think he would want to serve God in heaven above? No, the unbeliever has no place in heaven. He is dead in trespasses and sins. We are alive by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He is filled with hatred for God and for his neighbor and is an enemy of Jesus Christ. We love Jesus Christ because he first loved us. The unbeliever has no place in heaven. The unbeliever must repent and believe in Jesus Christ. But we, who believe in Jesus Christ, have eternal life already. Already. We 
already taste and know that God is good. Christ has already given to us this life. We do not have to wait, therefore, until we die before we receive and experience eternal life. Eternal life is simply a continuation of that life which God has already planted into our hearts at the moment of regeneration. It's not a continuation of this normal life, the life that all human beings have, that biological life. It's a continuation of the spiritual life, which is fellowship with God, which is to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And that life comes to us through the cross, by the resurrection, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That life is experienced in us when the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts. And we experience that as we Give back, as it were, ardent love to God for what he has given to us. And since that life, which we feel already in our hearts, which is the beginning of eternal joy, as the Catechism puts it, since it is eternal and everlasting life, we know that that life can never be lost, can never be extinguished by our sin, can never be taken away from us by the devil. And that life, which is the beginning of eternal joy, is simply a foretaste of something much better, something much richer, something much sweeter, and something much more glorious, which the Bible has described to us in Revelation 21. And so we ask the question with Peter in 2 Peter 3, verse 11. Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, to make way for the new heavens and new earth, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And the answer, of course, is we ought to live in thankfulness to God. We ought to live especially for this reason. Jesus Christ has died on the cross to purchase for us everything that we have looked at this evening in Revelation 21 and much more besides which we cannot even begin to imagine. That's our rich inheritance. I believe the life everlasting. Amen. Right. Father in heaven, for the glorious promise that is given unto us, everlasting life, in the new heavens and the new earth. How earthly minded we are at times, how little we think upon these things, how uninterested often we are concerning these things. We pray that thou will forgive us and prepare us and give us to experience more and more the beginning of eternal joy.